All right, good afternoon. Yeah. Happy New Year. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces again. It's good to see uh, a lot of our regulars coming back for our winter uh, winter 2017. I just realized I didn't update this flyer. Uh, <laughs> winter 2017 uh, lecture series. Uh, we've got a couple of cool things coming up for this year. Um, obviously today we have uh, Professor Sellers talking about the uh, Korean War. For those of you that are interested, February 12th, well, we're, we're going to have somewhat a uh, somewhat different presentation. We have uh, Sergeant Stephanie Shannon uh, coming in. She served in the Army in the, uh, the first Gulf War, and she's going to be talking about some of the challenges that uh, the female soldiers had while deployed and then and today. And, uh, she is uh, the founder and CEO of the Michigan Women Veterans Empowerment Group. It should be should be interesting, something uh, something a little outside of our normal lane, but it, I think it's going to be a cool one. Uh, March 26, we got Randy Hotton coming back. Uh, those of you uh, may remember him coming around talking about the arsenal of democracy and, uh, and uh, his time flying uh, P3s over Vietnam. Uh, he just finished a book, uh, another Arcadia book, on uh, the Royal Run Bomber Plant. And uh, he's heavily involved with the Yankee Air Museum, so he's coming out here going to be talking about the Royal Run Bomber Plant and, and their efforts to, uh, to save that little corner of it. And then in April, we've got a couple of events scheduled where we're going to be talking and, and celebrating the 100th anniversary of the American entry into the First World War. Uh, we're going to be putting an exhibit in the back room where we currently have the Bloom Throughout the Wars exhibit. And if anybody hasn't made it back there, you should check it out. It was put together as a silver certificate project by a group of uh, uh, Girl Scouts. Yes, they were all 12, 13 year old girls. So yes, we turned the entire room of the museum over to a group of 12 year old girls. But it came out really good. It's worth checking out if you haven't made it back there. They had fun painting. <laughs> and they did, they did a lot, of, a lot of work, they worked very hard. So, and then there's, you know, we've got the summer, our regular summer events, our car show, and our reenactment at Chesterfield, and we're going to try and do the road rally again this year. So, if you haven't picked up one of the flyers, even though it says 2016, because I'm not very smart, uh, please pick one up and mark your calendars accordingly. So, without any further delay, Professor? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be back here, and uh, it's always a pleasure to talk about the Korean War, that uh, often forgotten war at the very beginning of America's Cold War saga. Uh, a forgotten war that, uh, because of its kind of ambivalent relationship to the rest of the American military tradition that often leaves its veterans in an awkward spot in relation to both Vietnam, to World War II, and to some of the more recent wars of our own time. I've uh, described it as that unloved and unlovely war, unloved because it became very quickly deeply unpopular among the American people and unlovely, well, those of you who know something about uh, Korea know that this was a war fought in very unpleasant circumstances, in very unpleasant surroundings, um, with winter temperatures that might reach minus 35 below Fahrenheit and summer temperatures that might reach 102. It was a very unpleasant place to wage war. So let me begin by talking about the setting of Korean War, which I think we should describe as a civil war set within the Cold War. Uh, the Koreans themselves were longing in the post-World War II era for independence and national unity. Korea had been a colony of Japan from the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, but it had become a colony only after a thousand years of independent existence. For Korea, the vast uh, extent of its history had been as an independent nation. 
frequently at war with China and its neighbors, but generally unified. Korea was occupied by the Japanese at the beginning of the 20th century, and Japanese colonialism was extraordinarily brutal. Extraordinarily brutal in the uh, theft of resources from Korea, brutal in the treatment of Korean civilians, and uh, as World War II came on, brutal in particular in the treatment of women, large numbers of who were taken up as prostitutes for the Japanese armed forces. This occupation of Korea by the Japanese was never accepted. It was resisted from the beginning. But the resistance to that occupation took two different forms and identified two different traditions, if you will. On the one hand, there were those around the future North Korean leader, Kim Il-sung, who uh, stayed in country, uh, fought against the Japanese, either with the Chinese or with the Russians, but remained committed, uh, engaged, uh, and having their lives on the line from the whole period of the 1920s and 30s until the end of the war in 1945. The other tradition was that represented by the future South Korean president, Sigmund Rhee, who was an exile from Korea, spent most of the uh, 20s and 30s living of all places in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, living in the United States, received a PhD, uh, became a, a distinguished academic, but his connection, direct connection with Korea was far more tenuous than this other line of resistors. Which is not to say that he accepted even for a moment the Japanese resistance, but merely, or Japanese occupation, but merely that he was not on the ground to resist it. He was uh, at the head of a whole network of resistance forces that were based in the United States and elsewhere around the world, expats, essentially, who were looking forward to the return of sovereignty to Korea and the unification of the country. When World War II ended, the Soviet Union and the United States reached an agreement about the partition of the country along the 38th parallel, which is right along this line had no geographical significance whatsoever. It had never represented a cultural difference in Korea. It was merely a convenience for the two occupying forces uh, at the end of the war. Indeed, the line was made by Dean Rusk looking at a map on a hot August night in Washington, D.C., and drawn without reference to even a single Korean. Such a line, however, was not seen as being permanent. It was seen simply as a line of demarcation for occupation forces. And since the United States had no forces in Korea at the time, there was an open question as to whether the communists, the, the uh, Soviet Union, would actually stop at the 38th parallel or would in fact occupy the whole of Korea. They stopped at the 38th parallel and allowed for American troops, which arrived two or three weeks later, to finally catch up and occupy the South. Thus it was that Korea, rather than ending up as a unified country as it had been before the Japanese occupation, found itself divided in two. Divided in a way that Koreans did not, did not desire. Indeed, divided by governments that had not consulted Koreans in the slightest. And this set in motion a, a perfectly understandable and perfectly predictable effort by both sets of Koreans, North and South, to try to unify the country under their authority, under their command. Both the United States and the Soviet Union quickly tired of occupation duties both the United States and the Soviet Union withdrew their troops in the late 1940s. And as their troops came out, both of them established governments, one in the north under Kim Il-sung, uh, 
the other in the South under Sigmund Reed. The United Nations was expected to take on the responsibility, take on the task of unifying Korea. And the assumption was always that the United Nations, brand new institution, would find a way to unify the Koreas and bring to the Korean people what they clearly wanted, the unification of their country. But the Cold War began to settle in. The United Nations proved to be incapable of resolving the problem of Korean unification. And what had seemed to be initially just occupation forces north and south hardened into two competitive governments. These two competitive governments, North and South, communist and non-communist, proceeded to establish military forces, proceeded to establish civilian governments, proceeded to try to rebuild the country. As it turns out, neither side was much interested in democracy, freedom, or any of those things. Sigmund Rhee, uh, despite his many years living in the sedate comfort of Princeton, New Jersey, was a strict authoritarian himself, had very little interest in democracy, parliamentary procedure, or any of those things. And Kim Il-sung in the North showed far greater interest in redistributing land to the peasants of changing the very structure of the North Korean economy than he did in political niceties. Both governments, therefore, were far from ideal either to meet the aspirations of the Korean people or to, to meet the uh, expectations of the world that somehow Korea would evolve into a not only a unified state, but a well-governed and free state. This process in Korea occurred at exactly the same time that the United States was experiencing an intensification of the Cold War. This was precisely at the time when the United States was beginning to establish the outlines of a Cold War policy. And the most important of these Cold War policies from the Korean point of view was something called the Truman Doctrine. You may have heard of this. This was announced in 1947. The, the cause for behind this was the situation in Greece and Turkey, a civil war in Greece and a possible civil war in Turkey. The United States made it policy that it would henceforth intervene in any struggle anywhere around the world where freedom seemed to be at risk anywhere around the world where communism seemed to be on the march, anywhere around the world where governments might ask for our assistance. There were a number of people at the time, including the foreign policy expert who developed the idea of containment, George Kennan, the assistant to the ambassador in Moscow, who said that the Truman Doctrine was far too sweeping that no government in the history of the world had ever committed itself to intervening anywhere, anytime, or any government. That it lacked perspective, that it lacked balance, this Truman Doctrine. And as it turns out, Kennan's fears about how the Truman Doctrine might play it out were realized precisely in Korea. Korea was, as the Cold War began to take root in the United States, seen as a minor, problematic outpost of anti-communism. Sigmund Rhee, who had been established by us, flown there in an American plane, established in Seoul under our support, financed by the American taxpayer, Seoul, uh, Sigmund Rhee was a militant anti-communist, and therefore, South Korea came to be seen as a kind of outpost in the Cold War. A small, minor outpost. Most Americans couldn't find it on a map. Uh, one of the interesting things, uh, this would later be true of Vietnam as well, but uh, the overwhelming majority of Americans, when asked where Korea was, 
could not put it within 500 miles of its actual location, and the overwhelming majority could not put it in the right continent. Uh, the source of much public information in that area, Life Magazine, carried one article on Korea from 1945 to the outbreak of the war in 1951. This was a minor outpost in the Cold War, an outpost so obscure that most Americans didn't know where it was. The number of troops in Korea was tiny. They were there as part of a military aid group. Uh, trying to train the roughly 60,000 men who were to become part of the South Korean constabulary. Insofar as the Joint Chiefs of Staff paid note, paid any attention to South Korea at all, the prevailing assumption was that South Korea was completely unimportant for the security of the United States. War plans of that era held that if the Cold War became hot if the Third World War began, that Korea would be unimportant, that the most important outposts of the United States would be Japan, Okinawa, uh, and ultimately on to Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Korea was not considered to be part of that outpost system. From Kennan's point of view, back in 1947, this is exactly the kind of minor commitment that he dreaded. The kind of commitment to draw American forces into some sort of struggle that was relatively unimportant from a strategic point of view. Well, beginning in 1948, the Koreans, North and South, began to fight along the 38th parallel. Both sides organized raids against the other. Both sides were willing to use military force against the other. Now, as it happens, the Soviet Union had left tanks and other heavy gear in North Korea, and so the North Koreans were better organized for this kind of thing. But Sigmund Rhee was very aggressive in using his own armed forces to raid the North. And when the war actually broke out in June of 1950, many people plausibly said that it had begun with a South Korean attack on the North. Because there had been a number of large-scale raids from South to North, and again from North to South during this period. And so it was at least plausible, it was at least plausible that this was a South Korean attack that had gone astray. It, this, the evidence is clear that that wasn't what happened, but I pointed out only so that you recognize that this frontier was contested, that the war had actually begun as a struggle between North and South a couple of years before it involved us. And one of the reasons why Americans considered it a kind of problematic outpost was that the two North Koreans didn't seem to be under any, the two Koreas didn't seem to be under anyone's control. They seem to be pursuing their own agenda. And in, frankly, the Truman administration was increasingly unhappy with Sigmund Rhee's dictatorial tendencies and his inclination to start World War III in Asia. And therefore, the administration, in 1949 in particular, began to talk about withdrawing at least some of American foreign aid the military was careful to keep South Korean forces uh, weakly armed so that they could not carry out full-scale attacks on the North. And therefore, to try to limit the liability of the United States. At this stage, 1949, Truman was in line with the Joint Chiefs and with his diplomatic establishment that the Korea was relatively unimportant, that we should not be drawn into a war there. And therefore, we should take steps to protect our interest, to limit our liability. But the problem, the problem uh, began to spin out of control in 1948 and 49, as this war intensified and uh, as Sigmund Rhee became ever more dictatorial. One of the reasons why the United States was so reluctant to get involved here is that American military forces were so limited in that era. 
The army itself numbered just about half a million men. It was, at that stage, poorly trained and poorly equipped. Uh, virtually all of the forces available in the Far East were unprepared for war. The four divisions stationed in Japan uh, as occupation forces were particularly unprepared for any kind of military action. This reinforced the sense that the United States needed to stay out of Korea and even to stay out of this increasingly a bloody civil war between the two Koreas. Yeah. One question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the word constabulary. Yeah. With regard to Korea. Uh, the American forces that were in Germany at that time were also configured along a constabulary yep. uh, line too. Yeah. I'm wondering, were the Japan were the American forces in, in Japan the same? They were uh, they were organized as conventional infantry divisions, uh, but they were actually severely under strength. They were almost fifty percent under strength. Okay. Uh, they uh, not only was that true. I, I think that. Uh, the infantry regiments had three battalions instead of two. The infantry battalions had uh, three companies instead of four. Virtually all of the artillery was gone. None of the tanks were operational. Or like the staff were. Well, yeah, but not configured in quite that way. The fact of the matter is that uh, the Cold War was beginning to affect politics. It was beginning to affect diplomacy. But the military hadn't yet figured out what it needed to do and what the real threats were. And part of the issue was that uh, the Truman administration was determined to keep defense budgets low. And, uh, and thereby, to, as a consequence of that, to limit involvement in, in many of these danger spots. Uh, so that this constabulary that was in Korea on the South Korean side was capable of launching raids, not capable of launching a full-scale invasion. And Americans were determined to keep it that way. Yeah. Determined that it should stay that way. And frankly, the American forces available in the Far East, with the exception of the four divisions in Japan, uh, were the second division, which was in uh, uh, the west coast of the United States in Washington. 25th uh, Division, part of the 25th Division in uh, California, in uh, Hawaii, uh, and one regiment of the 1st Marine Division in California. Otherwise, there was nothing to uh, make use of. And therefore, limiting dangers seemed to be a primary goal. But in 1950, something fundamental happened, and American politicians, especially Harry Truman, became overcome with a sense of dread and panic. One of these things was the Chinese explosion, uh, was the success of the Chinese in capturing the communist Chinese in uh, taking control of China, and the other was the Russian explosion of an atomic bomb. And these two things uh, began to work on the psychology of American policymakers and began to put them in a panicky frame of mind. In the early spring of 1950, the National Security Council carried out a study which came to be known as NSC 68. You have an excerpt of this in your uh, packet there. NSC 68 rested on the premise that the possibility of World War III was real within the short term, not the long term. And that the United States faced a, an almost impossible military situation that required dramatic increases in military force. NSC 68 was so inflammatory uh, demanded such enormous increases in military spending and therefore went against the interests of the Truman administration that the Truman administration actually suppressed the document and no one actually saw NSC 68 until the 1970s. It got locked in safes where it would remain safe and out of view. 
The other source of panic, however, was a man named Joseph McCarthy. You know the name? <laughs> Joe McCarthy had begun in the spring of 1950 to make wild accusations. His famous Lincoln Day address is there in your hands. And as you can see, uh, on, this, on this day, he waved a piece of paper in the air and said that he had the names of 57 State Department officials who were actually working for the communists and were undermining American policy. And he sought to mobilize Congress and the American people against Truman, against these communist collaborators, and in favor of a more aggressive stance against Soviet communism. McCarthy was a hoax, a fake. He never had such a list. He gave the same speech half a dozen times over the next <coughs> month or two. Each time he gave the speech, he used a different number. One time he had 86 names on his list. Another time he had 34. One time he just had a lot of names. He never had any names at all. He never had a list. But the effect of McCarthy's speeches was to terrify the political establishment. And in Truman's mind in particular, the idea now of losing any territory, any territory to the communists, now began to look like a political and personal disaster. Because it fulfilled McCarthy's narrative. It fulfilled McCarthy's narrative that there were forces within the United States government who wanted communist victory. There were forces within the United States government that wanted an American defeat. There were forces in American government that were leading us to bad policies. And this took Truman from being a relatively cautious Cold Warrior to being a much more aggressive Cold Warrior. And it would lead him in the summer of 1950 to overrule all previous studies by the Joint Chiefs and the others of defense policy in the Far East and to commit the United States to a war in Korea. McCarthy, from that point of view, is a critical actor in this whole situation, a critical actor in this whole drama of the Korean War. Without McCarthy and without McCarthyism, probably no intervention in Korea. Indeed, I'll make the argument just between us that uh, without McCarthy, McCarthyism, no commitment to Vietnam either. Uh, such was the effect of McCarthy on the political establishment and on the psychology of Americans. The North Koreans had decided on an invasion of the South. As it became clear that the United States was not prepared to fight a full-scale war in Korea, as it became clear that the United States considered Korea to be a minor outpost, the North Koreans began to think about that dream of unifying the country under their authority. Same dream as of Sigmund Rhee, same dream as the Southerners, but the North Koreans had better military hardware and were more willing to think about a short war that would unify the country. North Korea, in fact, Kim Il-sung, went to the Soviet Union and said, look, Stalin, I think that we can win in Korea. I think that I can carry out a military campaign that will be brief. Americans have already said that this is a minor outpost for them. They probably won't intervene. We can unify Korea under communist authority in a month, maybe less. Stalin was deeply skeptical initially about this. You recall that the Soviet Union had lost 20 million dead in World War II. Much of the Western Soviet Union was still in ruins. Stalin was very cautious on the issue of anything that might lead to World War III. But Kim Il-sung said, look, it won't be a problem. The Americans won't do anything. Listen to what they've said. <clears throat> we can carry out this invasion. And when Stalin proved to be somewhat reluctant, Kim Il-sung went to the Chinese and said, look, here's a golden opportunity to 
advance the interests of communism and to unify the Korean people. In the end, the Soviet Union came around to the plan, provided material support for the plan, and indeed even some technical advice about how to organize a large-scale military operation uh, against <coughs> South Korea. But we need to be clear that uh, North Korea drove this decision. It was never uh, the Soviet Union's or China's primary goal, or it was not their initiative that brought this about. And thus, at the end of June 1950, North Korean forces launched an invasion of South Korea. What's striking about this uh, is that it was so small. Any of you ever go to a U of M football game? If you've been to a U of M football game, there are more people in U of M Stadium on any given Saturday than the whole of this North Korean invasion force. It was under 100,000 men. It was a relatively small force. It was relatively well armed because the Soviet Union had provided tanks and artillery and some planes. Undoubtedly, it would not have succeeded if the South Korean military forces had not been configured as a, configured as a constabulary instead of as a full-fledged military force. It probably wouldn't have succeeded also if most of the South Korean army had not been put on furlough uh, the days before the invasion. And so virtually all of South Korea's military units, weak as they were, were under strength and almost completely unprepared. It is ironic and kind of interesting that after almost two years of struggling along the border, that the South Korean military was not in any better shape than it was, but it wasn't. Uh, Sigmund Rhee, in the end, uh, was not prepared to resist a full-scale invasion from the North, even when that full-scale invasion was only about 100,000 troops. The communists made rapid advances uh, into Seoul and then headed southward along the roads led by their tanks. You can follow this on the map I've given you uh, as well. And the surprise, the surprise development in June and early July of 1950, I suppose, was not so much the North Korean invasion of the South. The surprise development was Harry Truman's decision that the United States should intervene. No one, including the American military, anticipated this decision. No one, including the American military, was prepared for such a decision. And it rested on Truman's calculation that in the age of McCarthy, if he didn't do something, he would be politically destroyed. If he didn't do something in Korea, he would look like a pawn of the communist movement. And thus, Truman makes a series of decisions to commit the United States to a war in Korea. Well, actually, he doesn't describe it as a war. He describes it instead as a police action. And he makes a tactical decision, a political decision, that he would not go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war, that he would use something uh, that was relatively undefined in that era, presidential war powers, that he would use these presidential war powers to carry out the conflict in Korea. And therefore, on his own authority, uh, after barely consulting Congress, he committed American troops to Vietnam. South Korea. South, yeah, <laughs> South Korea. I'll get my country straight eventually. Okay. Uh, there would be no declaration of war. There would never be a declaration of war in Korea, just as there would never be a declaration of war in Vietnam, because Lyndon Johnson would use the same tradition. We use this idea of presidential war power. The term police action is an interesting one. Uh, used by the administration from beginning to end, not universally, but, uh, but frequently. And uh, the term was being used by a number of colonial powers who were engaged in anti suppressing anti-colonial uh, movements. 
For instance, the Dutch in what became Indonesia were engaged in a police action against guerrillas. The British were engaged in a police action against guerrillas in Malaya. And so too, it, the French found themselves engaged in a police action in Indochina and later in Algeria and elsewhere. This was a term widely used at that time and suggests something of the confusion of many policymakers about what exactly they were doing. Part of the confusion arose from the fact that the United Nations was called upon almost immediately to aid the United States in Korea. Truman made his decision to commit American armed forces and then immediately went to the United Nations and asked for United Nations support in the struggle in Korea. Indeed, almost immediately, he received that support and then made the request that the, the United Nations, uh, the nations of the United Nations, contribute forces to aid in the effort in Korea. Yeah. Who was in, uh, who controlled Congress at this time? The Congress was controlled by Democrats at this time. And they didn't put up a fight. They did not put up a fight. Well, Go ahead, I, I, it, Was it because of McCarthy and, and the politics, or why? It was partly because of McCarthy and the politics, uh, in large part because of that. Uh, it was also because this notion of presidential war powers was starting to gain traction in the atomic age. Presidents alone had the power to use atomic weapons, to order the use of atomic weapons. And it was becoming more accepted, not yet universally accepted, more accepted that presidents probably should have broader authority to commit forces to military action than they had in the past. Uh, this was coupled, though, to one other thing, as, as perhaps you know, and that is the overwhelming expectation in Washington was that the war could, this event, police action, whatever, could not last more than a weekend. Because the prevailing sentiment was that big, tall American soldiers would stand up to little Asian soldiers, and the little Asian soldiers would go running back home at the mere sight of an American. If, if you look at uh, any number of interviews with American soldiers in this era, this was the almost universal expectation. We'll be there for a weekend, maybe for a week. It's not about being home for Christmas. We'll be home before September 1st. The prevailing sentiment was that the Koreans could not and would not fight. How did, how did Congress budget it, though? Congress then around, came around to the notion that we are committed. They began to, to, to complain to the Truman administration that uh, they had been bypassed. But no, Congress was not willing to cut off funding to troops once the troops were in Korea. And from that point of view, the same thing that happened in Vietnam and would happen many other places played out. And once the troops are on the ground, Congress finds its hands tied behind its back. There's not much that it can do. The complaint against Truman mounted as the war went badly. But initially, there's not much opposition. Most people say, ah, we're standing up to the communists. That's a good thing. Rather, I suppose, like uh, George Bush's 90 approval rating in 2001 is 85 percent approval rating in 2003 initially the public was enthusiastic and committed and only as the war went on did public opinion and congressional opinion change now the United Nations did not necessarily see the value of this whole enterprise and the commitment of United Nations forces, especially the commitment of United Nations forces under American command, was in some respects odd. Virtually all of the members of the United Nations did not understand the American fixation with Korea. They did not understand why Americans wanted to fight a war there. But most of the nation, many of the primary nations who were represented in the United Nations 
were not willing to turn their back on an American commitment. They realized that their security depended to some considerable extent on the United States, and therefore they felt that they should play along to some extent. Even if they didn't think the intervention was wholly necessary, and thus uh, a number of nations, about 16 nations, eventually commit troops. The British commit the largest. Our friends across the river in Canada can, uh, uh, commit a full brigade group to fight in Canada. There's almost a brigade of Australians and then smaller forces from the Philippines, Ethiopia, Colombia. Uh, there's a brigade from Turkey. There's a whole collection of yeah. forces. And these forces, uh, these forces all came under American command which was acceptable at the beginning of the struggle, became increasingly difficult to defend uh, as the war went on. One other thing I want to be clear about these other nations, uh, especially Great Britain, is that virtually everyone who committed troops to the United States was still recovering, committed troops to the Korean War, was still recovering from World War II. England, uh, England was in the midst of this war in Malaya. It had occupation troops in Germany. Uh, it was trying to defend Hong Kong uh, from the communist Chinese. They were fully stretched, and of course, World, world War II had largely yeah, bankrupted. They were still dealing with the, uh, with the aftermath of Palestine. Yeah, they were still largely bankrupt from World War II. Uh, the same was true of France, which sent a, a battalion to Korea. Uh, virtually all of the nations sending troops, including the Canadians, uh, did so uh, at great expense and with great difficulty. Uh, their commitment to the war in Korea was uh, considerably less fervent than that of the United States. Douglas MacArthur was the American commander in the Far East, and he was given command of all United Nations forces, uh, including those of Britain, France, Canada, and everyone else. Uh, he became commander in chief of uh, all of the armed forces of the United States operating in the Pacific area. And uh, in many respects, the war through 1951 would be his war. Given the condition of the military forces that the United States possessed, they could not be committed wholesale, they could not be committed in decisive ways, they were in fact committed in dribs and drabs. Their quality was extremely poor. Among other things, they lacked almost completely anti-tank ammunition and effective anti-tank bazookas. Uh, Task Force Smith, which was the first American uh, force uh, committed in this basic area here, just so south of Osan. Uh, about 500 men had two anti-tank anti shells that it could use and no more. No more even in sight. There just weren't any anywhere in the Pacific. The three 2.36 inch bazookas that have been developed during World War II would not penetrate the armor of Russian tanks. The 3.5 millimeter bazookas that were available would, but they were not available uh, in the Far East at all. American troops, when committed to Korea, uh, found themselves in an almost impossible situation. And indeed, were forced backward, backward, and backward until they ended up in a perimeter around the port city of Busan in August and early September of 1950. One note on the bazookas. Uh, they wouldn't penetrate the frontal armor, but they would penetrate the side of your rear. Yeah. All you had to do was get to the side and behind us. That, that was the other problem. Yeah, that, that was the the, the minor difficulty that presented itself <laughs> to many of these poorly trained uh, Americans. So the tank unit that overran, uh, <laughs> that was a T-3045 unit that overran Task Force Smith, kept on firing and moving. They basically went, what was that? And kept on going. They didn't yeah. stop the fight them. They, they, left, they left Task Force Smith to be dealt with by the infantry. Yeah, they, they, just, they just drove right through right. them. 
and yeah. indeed drove right through the tank, the armored, the artillery unit behind Task yeah. Force Smith, yeah. and um, that was ugly. Yeah, it was very ugly. Yeah. It was very ugly. <laughs> now, the retreat of American forces and South Korean forces to Busan uh, shifted American attitudes about Korea decisively because now it appeared. Uh, that the war was not going to be over in a weekend or a week. On the contrary, it looked as though there was going to be a Dunkirk in Asia, except that we'd be the, for the nation withdrawing troops. And there was something like enhanced panic in Washington on this very point. And frankly, many of our allies who had committed themselves to sending troops to Korea said, we, not exactly that we told you so, but uh, said that we wish you had been more cautious in this respect. We wish that you had weighed the risks a little bit more seriously. The Joint Chiefs and the political uh, establishment did what it could. The second division was sent from the west coast of the United States. Uh, troops were being mobilized all over to send, but with a total of only 10 divisions available, uh, the United States eventually committed everything but a single division. I can't remember if it was the 82nd Airborne or the 101st Airborne Division. That was the only thing left in the strategic reserve of the United States. Everything else was committed to this Korean struggle. But as I say, the troops arrived in bits and pieces. McCarthy, how, MacArthur, however, <coughs> was convinced that he could turn the tide on the North Koreans and could, in fact, win the war. He looked at a map and decided that an amphibious assault against the city of Incheon, which is about right there, would put American forces behind the North Koreans, force them to retreat from the Busan perimeter, uh, and lead to their uh, strategic defeat. The problem was that there were literally no troops available for this. And he appealed to the Joint Chiefs, and the Joint Chiefs did something uh, extraordinary. They created a Marine Division for him. Uh, they created the 1st Marine Division by pulling in virtually every unattached Marine, literally from around the world. Every stray Marine battalion, many sold many Marines who were guarding embassies, they were all brought into Camp Pendleton and very quickly converted into three Marine regiments, 1st, 5th, and 7th, the artillery regiment, the 11th, and that was joined with the 7th Infantry Division, the last remaining infantry unit in Japan. But the 7th Division had already lost more than half of its soldiers because the other three divisions, as they deployed to Korea, took every available specialist and trained man out of the 7th Division. And so when the 7th Division was deployed to join MacArthur's Incheon invasion, almost half of its strength consisted of South Korean draftees who didn't speak English had virtually no training whatsoever. It was with this force that MacArthur decided to turn the tide. And in the uh, fall of, 18, of 1950, this invasion of Incheon was carried out and succeeded largely because of the skills that the Navy continued to possess in amphibious warfare. By Pulling out of mothballs every available ship and every available uh, landing craft, they were able to produce a force that could carry out this assault. Do any of you know about this assault? Uh, Incheon is a fascinating uh, and very risky enterprise because of the tidal shift, which is about 30 feet. Uh, the beach. At high at high tide, you're at the beach. At low tide, you're 30 feet below the beach. And this posed enormous difficulties for the Navy and the Marines. The difficulties, however, which the Navy and the Marines succeeded in solving. I think it should be mentioned that there really wasn't a beach. It was a, a, yeah, a, a seawall. Sea they had to use assault ladders 
Yeah. And, and, the, and the, 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 the National Marine Corps assault. That's probably the greatest moment in the United States Marine Corps. Yeah. yeah. It really was. In, essentially, in many respects, it, it guaranteed that they would survive into the 1950s. Yeah, because Truman wanted to get rid of them. Yeah, Truman was desperate to almost to get rid of them. This attack at Inchon succeeded. Uh, the capture of Seoul followed within about to 10 days after that. South North Korean forces from around Busan began to fall back. The remnants of the 8th Army <coughs> around Busan began to advance. And in September of 1950, it appeared as though the war was over and had been a remarkable success. Indeed, most, uh, most of the politicians involved, and certainly most of our United Nations allies, thought that the war had succeeded, the North Korean invasion was turned back, it was clear that the 38th parallel was about to be restored again, and therefore the war could be over. But that's to not consider dear Joe McCarthy. Because what, what Truman took away from McCarthy's continued assaults was the need to win a bigger victory in Korea. What Truman now thought was probably necessary was to win in Korea, to unify Korea under Sigmund Rhee. And this idea had the full support of Douglas MacArthur, who began to imagine that uh, this campaign in Korea was going to be the capstone of his career. MacArthur began to behave with increasing arrogance in relation to Truman and in relation to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He essentially began to carry out a military strategy that was different than that of the United States government, but no one after Inchon was willing to call him to account. No one was willing to stop him and therefore he went forward. Again, the United States uh, consulted the United Nations. The United Nations agreed that an invasion of South Korea under some, or North Korea under some circumstances was acceptable. The British government, which was deeply alarmed by this expansion of the war, nevertheless went along with this invasion of North Korea. And therefore in October and November of 1950, American, South Korean, and UN forces went north of the 38th parallel with the intention of creating a great victory for anti-communism in the unification of Korea. Now, beginning in the fall of 1950, the Chinese had begun sending warnings, mostly via the, the Indian government, uh, but they had sent some messages by way of the English government, and the messages were essentially that if American troops come anywhere close to the Yalu River, anywhere close to the frontier with China, we will intervene. These messages were, in retrospect, crystal clear, that the Chinese were prepared to defend their frontier against any Western forces, Perhaps uh, if you want an analogy, think about the attitude of the United States to the presence of French forces in Mexico right after the American uh, Civil yeah. War. Uh, in any case, the Chinese were clear on this point, but Truman listened to MacArthur and MacArthur said, the Chinese are bluffing. The Chinese cannot send forces into Korea. If the Chinese send forces in Korea, they will be small and I can defeat them with air power. The British, the French, the others were increasingly alarmed because they heard these warnings as well. And they feared that the United States was leading them into a military disaster. But MacArthur went ahead. The Truman administration crossed its fingers and went ahead. And the outcome was that the Chinese did exactly what the Chinese said they were going to do. In October of 1950, they intervened 
uh, south of the uh, capital, the former capital of North Korea, they intervened and nearly destroyed one of the regiments of the 1st Cavalry Division. It's generally thought that this was a warning to Americans. We're here, you can't see us, you don't anticipate our actions, here's a chance to not go any further. MacArthur paid not the slightest attention, and as uh, the logistical situation of his forces improved, he prepared for a massive attack into North Korea beginning in November of 1950. Part of this massive invasion of North Korea involved taking the forces that had invaded Incheon, the so-called 10th Corps, withdrawing them from the 8th Army and moving them all the way around to Wonsan and Hongnam and to send them on a separate, disconnected military enterprise towards the Yalu River. This again struck MacArthur as being absolutely plausible because he didn't believe that there were Chinese forces to resist him. He did not believe that the North Koreans could mount any opposition to him. And therefore, the forces of the United Nations and of the United States were divided in November of 1950 in a way that nearly led to the disaster of both. In November of 1950, the Chinese forces intervened they intervened with roughly 400,000 men. That is to say, their forces were roughly equivalent to the United Nations forces, but their appearance was a surprise, and their effect on United Nations forces was overwhelming and disastrous. The second division in the 8th Army on this side of the peninsula was almost completely destroyed by the Chinese intervention. And on the East Coast, the 1st Marine Division, which found itself up around the Chosen Reservoir, was cut off and surrounded by roughly 180,000 Chinese soldiers. The 1st Marine Division, the 7th Army Division, which was its neighbor, found themselves about 65 miles from the coast and nothing but Chinese between their position and the coast. This was among the most frightening moments of the whole Cold War militarily, and the beginnings of a long and disastrous retreat by American, South Korean, and United Nations forces. The 10th Corps, the 1st Marine Division, as you probably know, uh, managed to fight its way down to uh, Hangnam and was ultimately withdrawn by the Navy. The 8th Army on the West Coast began a long retreat that carried it all the way back south of Seoul. You can see this on one of the maps I've given you. The 8th Army's retreat carried it well below Seoul. Seoul fell to the Communists for a second time. It had fallen early in the war. Now it fell to the Chinese. Uh, a, uh, and became part of the uh, communist North Korea for a second time. Many Americans, and this included MacArthur, now began to dread what was going to happen, and even MacArthur began to talk about a Dunkirk-like evacuation from Korea. It appeared, indeed, that the United States, United Nations, South Korea were going to suffer a catastrophic defeat. There was deep anxiety in Washington, and politicians who had been supportive of the war now began to raise questions about it. In London, there was deep anxiety. At the United Nations, there was deep anxiety. And at this point, in December of 1950, Harry Truman managed to make one of those gaffes that he was famous for. He managed to, su to suggest that the United States might be willing to use atomic and nuclear weapons against the Chinese. This caused utter and complete panic among our allies who were not interested in fighting World War III in Korea or as a result of Korea. 
The British Prime Minister flew over directly to try to hold Truman's hand and say, calm down, Harry, calm down, and managed to win at least a temporary agreement that he would not use, Truman would not use atomic or nuclear weapons without consulting at least our British allies. Under these circumstances, with the most dire military situation uh, going on, uh, the commander of the 8th Army, Walton Walker, was killed in a jeep accident. And Matthew Ridgway, who had commanded airborne troops in World War II, very distinguished commander, very highly esteemed commander, was brought out from Washington to command the 8th Army. And Ridgway, very quickly, that is within a month, had begun to stiffen the 8th Army, had begun to slow and then stop its route and retreat. He had begun the process of restoring morale, in part because he insisted on visiting virtually every combat unit to see what conditions were. He insisted on being visible to the soldiers. And he began a series of limited offensives. Again, you can see this on the map in your, uh, in your hand. A series of limited offensives northward, which eventually carried American, South Korean, and UN troops into Seoul again. Seoul was uh, freed for a second time by Ridgeway. But this Chinese intervention had set in motion a bitter argument within the United States over what the purpose of Korea was. There are many people in the United in Washington D.C. who said that the Vietnam, that the Korean commitment was unnecessary, unneeded, undesirable. You can see the quote I have at the very beginning of the lecture from uh, uh, Omar Bradley, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Korea is the wrong war at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong enemy. Many people were coming to that conclusion, certainly the professional military leaders were, but MacArthur was committed to the idea that the United States should go over to the offensive, the strategic offensive, that it should wage war against both China and Russia, that if there was to be World War III, now was the time to launch it, and he was the man to carry it out. And he began a very public disagreement with the Truman administration about what American policy was. And this public disagreement, which caused unbelievable amounts of heartache and uh, acid reflux for our allies, eventually led, uh, in 1951, to Truman removing MacArthur from command in the Pacific and putting Matthew Ridgway in his place. You can see in the packet of things I've given you a couple of documents. One is Truman's statement on this whole issue. And you can also see there uh, Douglas MacArthur's uh, insistence that the United States launch full-scale war. This Removal of MacArthur was a political crisis of the first order. MacArthur was enormously popular with many Americans. He was loathed by roughly an equal number of Americans. And it wasn't clear that Harry Truman would avoid being impeached as a result of this removal of Douglas MacArthur. As it turned out, the United Front by the Joint Chiefs, the support of our UN allies uh, in favor of Truman's decision largely diffused the case. And by 1952, MacArthur was already a uh, has-been. Uh, as you know, MacArthur had presidential ambitions, aspirations. Uh, he desperately wanted to run for president in 1948. He desperately wanted to run again in 1952, but his removal from command was ultimately seen as appropriate and just by the American people, and he 
never became a viable presidential candidate. Yeah. It was probable that MacArthur uh, might have been viable in some views, but he incurred quite a bit of rancor, especially amongst uh, New Guinea veterans and uh, others of, uh, from early in the war uh, over his conduct in the New Guinea yeah, operations. There were plenty of people as from far as the, he was not very popular. Plenty of people from World War, War II who disliked him. On the other hand, plenty of cold warriors lionized him. Yeah, that's true. Plenty of cold warriors lionized him. So with Matthew Ridgway in charge, the war now settled into a stalemate uh, roughly along the 38th parallel, a little bit north of the 38th parallel on the east side, a little south of the 38th parallel on the west side. And the war settled into a really unfortunate pattern, unfortunate from the point of view of the American public. Negotiations for some sort of truce had begun in 1951 at Andrew John, uh, north of the Seoul, up in this area. Uh, but those negotiations proved to be indecisive, and while they went on, the nations engaged in war carried out a series of bloody attacks on individual hills. Uh, the air war continued to escalate. The war at sea continued, and especially in the south central part of South Korea, a nasty guerrilla war developed as well. The war in Korea, therefore, became one of bloody futility from 1951 onward. And the American public became increasingly unwilling to accept the war. Public opinion polls from that era indicate very clearly that the Vietnam War was not, that the Korean War was not only unpopular, it was probably more unpopular than the Vietnam War would be later. The American public could not stomach the war, and yet, because of McCarthy and McCarthyism, because of the danger of criticizing government policy in Korea and anywhere else. Anti-war movements never get traction during the Korean War. The war therefore went on at places like Pork Chop Hill. Do you, any, you know, have you ever read S.L.A. Marshall's famous book about this? One of the most nasty and futile military enterprises in modern times. Uh, simply running up the death toll on both sides. It was, had evolved into or devolved into a limited war in which both sides had sanctuaries. The North Koreans and their Chinese allies had hundreds of planes. They did not choose to attack the South. The United States and its allies had hundreds of planes and chose to make uh, only very limited and sporadic attacks on the North. Neither side used sea power in any decisive way against the other. The most interesting aspect is that the Chinese, who possessed uh, dozens of submarines and could have uh, created havoc on the supply chain, on the logistics chain of UN forces coming into Korea, doesn't do that. And so both sides observe a, a kind of agreement that the war will not be expanded. As the war went on, the problems of dealing with Sigmund Rhee became ever more complicated because Sigmund Rhee, rather than backing away from his aspiration to unify Korea, became more committed to it. And he began to demand that the United States commit or create for him 10 new divisions with which he could invade the North, with which he could wage war against China. And the United States found itself increasingly having to deal with this dictator whose aspirations ran roughly in the opposite direction of American policy. The continuation of the war drove Truman's approval ratings down. Do anyone know how low his approval ratings went? They reached historic lows, 22%. Uh, uh, only George Bush the Younger had approval ratings in roughly the same neighborhood. The American public came to loathe Harry Truman. In 1952, 
Democratic candidate Adlai Stevenson was defeated by Dwight Eisenhower. And Eisenhower made a pledge here in Detroit that had to do with the Korean War. He promised to do something that Truman had never done, and that is to go to Korea itself. Given what we see in our own time of the frequency when the presidents go to war zones, and indeed even to see in World War II the frequency with which uh, Franklin Roosevelt went to war zones, it's striking that Harry Truman never went to Korea, never went even within a thousand miles of Korea. Eisenhower, on the other hand, promised that if elected, he would go to Korea. And very shortly after the election in October of uh, November of 1950, he did just that. He spent a number of days, flew over the battlefields, talked to everyone who was important, listened to the plans of the generals to double the size of the American army, wage full-scale war against China and Korea, and reached the conclusion that the generals in Korea were insane, and that the only thing to do was to end the war as quickly as possible. And so he came back to the United States committed to the fact that the war had to end. And uh, by July of 1953, the war indeed did come to an end. The complications were enormous, not only trying to disengage forces, uh, which were negotiated at Panmunjom, but what to do with the enormous number of prisoners, something over 80,000 communist prisoners held by United States and UN forces. Here again, South Korean President Sigmund Rhee stood in the way of any end of the war. He, in fact, declared himself determined to continue the war, even if the United States stopped it that he would try to find some way to keep the war going. And one of the things he did was try to torpedo the arrangement that had been reached at Panmunjom about the uh, exchange of prisoners of war. Uh, the plans had been to exchange uh, prisoners of war. Uh, virtually all of the North uh, Korean and Chinese prisoners of war would come home. The American, British, South Korean prisoners would come back to their homes. Uh, but re set about trying to torpedo that. Eisenhower was so infuriated that he uh, made plans, you can see these in Eisenhower's papers, he made plans to overthrow Sigmund Rhee himself. His essential position was enough already. This man could not stand in the way of American policy. But in July, finally, the war came to an end. An armistice was signed, and the fighting stopped. As you probably know, however, uh, large numbers of American troops are still in Korea. The American 2nd Division is still in Korea. Americans still have command responsibility in Korea. The 8th Army Headquarters, I believe, is still in Korea. And if the North Koreans do anything crazy this afternoon, then Americans will be killed instantly, and we will be back in the Korean War again. Uh, after a slight break of 60 years. No peace in Korea. What? Days, sir. Huh? Second division is not totally there. No, it, it, it had been drawn down. In fact, uh, the forces there have been significantly drawn down, although significant uh, capabilities remain there for strengthening and reinforcing those forces. So what lessons uh, might have been learned as a result of this, but weren't wholly learned. One is that China was a great military power and needed to be taken seriously. No one paid much attention to that until Richard Nixon was president in the 19, late 60s and early 70s. The United States continued to try to ignore China, to operate as though China didn't exist even though China provided very substantial aid, for instance, to the uh, war to North Vietnam in the Vietnam War itself. Second lesson that uh, could have been learned, might have been learned, was that the United Nations was an increasingly reluctant ally due to its changing membership and due to the perception that American policy is not trustworthy, that American policymakers are often loose cannon. How many 
What was the United Nations role in the Vietnam War? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What was the uh, role of our NATO allies in the Vietnam War? Uh, there was no. Australian participation. No, that's ASIN. Uh, I believe for some NATO. British participation. But from our NATO allies, Britain, Canada, France, Belgium, all of whom sent troops to Korea, none of them would participate in Vietnam at all. There was a strong feeling as a result of the, of the Korean War that American policy is on its own peculiar paths, that it's not the path that other nations are interested in or even that other nations feel safe with. Third point, and that is that Europe wanted American support. If there was to be a third world war, they knew they needed American support. On the other hand, they didn't trust American leadership at all. Uh, and I would suggest to you uh, that this is an ongoing problem, even into the 21st century, that the attitude of much of the world to American leadership is one of extraordinary suspicion. They just don't believe that we know what's going on and have the stability to make sensible policies. The Korean War illustrates the limits of what force can do. There's some things that military force, even the United States, can't do. I think we know this now from Afghanistan. We know it from Vietnam. We may know it from Iraq. There's just some things that military forces configured the way ours are cannot do. And certainly the Korean War seemed to drive that home. Fifth point. Soldiers are the ones who suffer most in these unloved, forgotten wars. It's not like World War II, where everyone is committed to the struggle, where every family has some skin in the game. Uh, the, Vietnam, the Korean War, like the Vietnam War, uh, was a situation where most families did not have representation, most families were not involved, and those who were involved were the ones who bore the psychological scars of the war itself. I've always thought that the war in Korea and the later war in Vietnam were most like those wars that Britain and France used to wage in their colonies. So I'll put this out to you and see what you think. Uh, back in the day, right, the British would send their army off to Egypt or off to India to fight in some unnamed war. Hundreds of thousands of men would be killed and injured, but no one paid any attention to that because the soldiers were professionals and they were expected to die for the Queen and the Empire. The problem with Vietnam and Korea was that that kind of war in a distant place for some nebulous purpose was largely carried out by draftees. And that was going to make it more difficult to understand why the war was necessary or even to support the war. Finally, let me close by saying Something I'm sure you've all thought about and all recognize, it's a lot easier to get into wars than it is to get out of them. It's very easy to send in the troops, it's easy to make claims, it's easy to uh, project victory, and far harder to deliver that victory, and when the victory is delivered, almost impossible to get out. Thank you very much. short, uh, if it was not very costly, right? those Korean War, the, those soldiers who went to Korea in 1950 thought they were going to be home, literally thought they were going to be home for a week. And there was a great deal of enthusiasm for a short, decisive war that would show American power. The problem is that uh, that problem that we see in Iraq and elsewhere, and that is that the American public 
is not very good at these long-term commitments, especially when the issues become increasingly nebulous. Almost from the beginning, the British newspapers began to show, began to publish stories about the atrocities carried out by the Sigmund Rhee government. And while those weren't published wholly in the United States, Americans quickly came to understand that Sigmund Rhee wasn't a Democrat, that he didn't stand for elections and political parties and all of those things. And the fact that he didn't do that confused the American public, right? They went into Korea thinking we're going to protect democracy and suddenly found that they were instead protecting a dictator who had an agenda very different than our own. And that seems to have complicated enormously the whole problem of commitment to the war, willingness to fight and die there, and so on. Does that answer your question? It, it kind of, uh, like I was mentioning at, at, at the uh, onset, it just seems like there are other variables that came into play that prevented it from uh, getting into a lot more hotter war than it did. And that's all I was just kind of curious about. Um, I know there is still some stuff in World War II for some reason. Right. There's still, still a little bit here. But what, what we know is that the Truman administration, uh, especially after the Chinese intervention, decisively rethought the whole strategy and realized, in retrospect, that it had been a mistake to invade North Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, they committed themselves to a limited war. If World War III were to begin, that the, the uh, central battlefront of that war would be in Europe, and therefore Korea needed to be marginalized. Essentially, what the Joint Chiefs had said back in 1947-48, that Korea is marginal. If it hadn't been for the intervention of Joe McCarthy, and McCarthyism, uh, more sensible policy probably would have, and more supportive policy. Other questions? Yeah. You had made a mention, uh, a mention earlier about the task force Smith and, yeah. and also the soldiers being told that the, the, the North Koreans, uh, you know, there weren't going to be a lot of them. They weren't going to put up a fight if they ran into Americans. I read a, a, a report from a lieutenant that was in task force Smith that was captured. And his thing was the same thing. Everybody was told that. That they were going to be, they, you know, they were little guys. That they would be, you know, they they are being told the North Koreans that they're not even going to run into Americans, and if they did, they would quit. He said they didn't quit, and they weren't little guys. They were big guys, and um, like he said, and the one thing I got out of his report and some other things that intelligence was not there, right. or they weren't listening to it, or it wasn't. They were, he said they were getting thrown up against things they had no idea what was ahead of them, and. Um, uh, you know, and then subsequently they, they you know, were getting beat, you know, because they had no idea what was what was coming at them. It's probably right to say that since uh, the army did not imagine it was going to fight a war in Korea, it made very little effort to establish the, the parameters of North Korean strength or anything about the capacities of the North Korean army. Uh, and. Then, what became clear is that as the war went on, uh, MacArthur became willful in his ignoring of the intelligence that well, was. I agree. That I know the intelligence was there. And, and like you say, and I, it's happened from time, you know, in memorial, I guess. They just, people don't want to listen to what the intelligence people are telling them. Right. They, they have an agenda, and it doesn't fit their agenda. They're going to do what they want to do. So Yes, I think that's absolutely right. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a tad perplexed about uh, Truman comes up with the Truman Doctrine in 1947 to intervene or, or to confront yeah. anywhere, but made no military policy to back that up. Yep. I've often been perplexed by that myself. It, it, it's, it, and it's at, in fact, it was uh, so we widely up. accepted in Congress uh, uh, by people like Arthur Vandenberg here in Michigan. It, but the, the, the underlying assumption seems to have been that all the United States needed to do was point, shake its finger, and everyone would go scurrying away. Uh, it is, I think it's really fascinating that during this period, immediately after the Truman Doctrine, the reduction of the Army and of the Air Force continues, and the near destruction of the Marine Corps uh, is carried out. It really, the, the 
the gap between the policy and the means to achieve the policy are striking. And again, I should, in defense of Kennan, who's my hero here, Kennan said, look, no nation can do this, and we certainly can't do this. Under the circumstances, we can't go everywhere and defend everyone. Let's have some limitation about what we can do. But then along comes Joe McCarthy, and then uh, along comes Joe McCarthy, and then it becomes difficult to carry out any kind of rational policy. Well, but in a sense, McCarthy really wasn't wrong. I mean, if we hadn't intervened, they would have taken over that. The yes. communists would have taken over that peninsula in no time. They did in no right. time. And if we hadn't had any troops there and never come in, they would, you know, and it would have happened in Vietnam, would happen everywhere. Right. Really, what he was saying was going to happen. Right. So I mean, the only the only question was whether was whether that was important or not. Yeah. It the, the, the original motion <laughs> of the joint. Well, it's not important to the Europeans because they felt right. that was where the war. That's you know they they were worried about their area. I'm sure it's important to people, the Japanese and. the Philippines and Australia. Yeah, the, the Joint Chiefs, though, had always argued that Korea was, given this location, a marginal front. Uh, and if it, went, if it went communist, that'd be regrettable. But something, you know, you just can't do anything about. Or given the cost of trying to change the direction, it's not worth the cost, right? right? And so South Korea was saved here. Sigmund Rhee uh, remained in power until, what, the 1970s when he was overthrown because he was too dictatorial even for his own army. And uh, was that worth the 33,000 Americans who died there and 105,000 who were wounded and the additional 12,000 who died of diseases, right? I mean, I, I don't know how to make that kind of calculation. I never want to be in the Department of Defense and have to make those kinds of calculations. But I think that uh, that was the kind of thing that the Joint Chiefs were keeping in mind. What is it that we're willing to invest in here? What is it that, what's worth American lives, right? Yeah. The fact that uh, the attitudes of uh, Task Force Smith and the information levels and all that good stuff happened is appalling, but what's even more appalling is that that's not the first time things like that have happened in the American military. Uh, there were similar uh, sentiments, if you will, events when and, and pronouncements made when we went to go fight the Japanese. Right, and one would have thought at that point that, given that, and which it wasn't all that long prior to the incident, or incidents, <coughs> if you will, uh, that we might have learned something. We but, did. Oh, I, I, and the I, case I, of McCarthy, I would not agree with that. Too. We have, we, if you, if you go to, if you attend Command General Staff College, there is a class called No More Task Force Smith. <laughs> and um, it's actually called that. And um, you study why Task Force Smith was in the predicament it was at. That has been a theme since the 19th, since the rebuilding after Vietnam is the readiness, which is why, you know, in, in the 1980s, when uh, you were in an infantry unit and you were in Germany or Korea, you spent 80% of your time in the field training, preparing. The way we manage maintenance now, that maintenance was a huge issue for these guys. When the first M26 tanks were offloaded in Pusan, they didn't have any fan belts on them. None. Couldn't start them. Didn't know where they were in the warehouse back in Japan. So tanks just sat there because we didn't have we didn't have the intense maintenance procedures that we do now. Now every Monday morning, every infantry and tank unit gets out there and goes completely over its vehicles. And um, there's status reports that go to the Pentagon of what that battalion in Korea has and does not have anymore. So Task Force Smith was a huge lesson in the United States Army on how not to do something prior to the war. Because when you show up in Pusan and the guy walks down, I, to me, if, if, I was, if I was Smith and they walk up and said, drive towards Osan and stop the North Korean Army, and you got four companies of infantry and one company of, one battery of artillery, I would have said, what kind of things are you smoking, General? Because uh, four companies is not going to stop much of anything. So. Um, but that's what happened, and that's the wrong time to start figuring out where your fan belt is and where your bazooka round is and all that kind of stuff. 
And, and the, the difficulty that we're describing here is, of course, part of the larger difficulty. You have this Truman Doctrine, and yet you have four divisions in Japan completely unprepared for yeah. any kind yeah. of... Military. And under strength. Under strength. Yeah. Way under strength. Completely yeah. unprepared for any yeah. kind They're of... They're all drafting. What people don't understand is it takes money to train your force. You just don't walk outside and train. You got to pay for ammunition. You got to pay for fuel. You got to pay for people to do things. You got to pay to use the land. Training an army is expensive, and we weren't paying for it in 1946 and 1947. The guys in Japan sat in barracks. They did nothing. Uh, now, apparently, they went drink beer, yeah. beer. <laughs> and then they chased Japanese women. I mean, that that was that was, and they loved it. It was great duty, but I mean, it wasn't infantry duty. And then suddenly, suddenly. You're on a hill in some godforsaken place just south of Osan, waiting to stop a whole North Korean tank regiment. Ain't gonna happen. You're gonna die. That's what happened. Other questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, so it's sort of a what if. Any uh, other question here? On the first drive north in uh, September that we had there, would have, the Chinese are giving us messages to stop. Right. What would happen if we would have stopped at a certain point? It seems clear that the Chinese were not committed to intervening. Uh, if, if the United States had, in fact, stopped. Uh, there's some disagreement about whether an advance by the South Korean forces might have been acceptable. Uh, yeah, that was my next uh, half But of course, the South Korean forces and South Koreans kept going. The South Korean forces didn't really have the capability to advance without American support, yeah. so that was probably off the table. Uh, but the Chinese were were pretty clear on this point, especially after that intervention against the First Cavalry Division in October of 19 uh, of 1950. Uh, there was a, law, a substantial break in there before there was any further military action by the Chinese. It's, pretty, it's recently clear that the Chinese were sending a warning. Okay. We're all here. Yeah. We we are prepared to meet you. We would suggest we would suggest that you not come any further. <laughs> it will be, uh, be ugly if you come further. But the cavalry so. regiment was specifically the Eighth Cavalry Regiment. Yeah. We thought we that's the problem of sending a message in that form because. I believe we thought we defeated them because they pulled back and they said, "Well, the Chinese Chinese are nothing. Let's just keep on going." Because <laughs> look, the very first, the very thing they hit us, they hit us hard, and then they, they pulled back. They're not coming. Well, we thought we had defeated them, and they were not capable of doing a further intervention. And then we ran into them in the hills. I was going to say a slightly different point. This is a classic illustration of why diplomatic relations are so important because. The messages we got from the Chinese had to come by way of the Indians and the English. It would have been much handier to have them be able to talk directly to an American ambassador or directly to have the Chinese ambassador speak directly to the American Secretary of State. But the nature of these quote, cold war diplomatic policies made that impossible. In order for them to hit the American ambassador, they would have had to go to Taipei. Right. And of course, no one was going to do that. No one wanted to go talk. <laughs> Unless you're a Texas politician, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the other thing was, too, is that the Chinese had their own intervention and confrontations with the nationalists. Yes. At that point, they were trying to take uh, Formosa, aka Taiwan, and there were a number of battles Still that were given around the matter. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing that disturbs me about Korea and every war we have fought since then. Um, Five with a bunch of little ones. Every one of them, in my mind, is illegal. And we did not do the constitutional requirement of declaring war. Mm -hmm. And and I think it is incumbent upon us as American citizens, really, I believe this fully and heartfully, to get to our Congress and get them to do their job. They they abdicated five times by not declaring war because the declaration of war is a law. And and. It, it encodes in the law and then demands that the administration carries it out, and we're doing it backwards. And therefore, nobody in, in the end is held accountable. Um, and we need to have that debate. We need to have that debate right up front and an understanding of what we're going to get into. And we're very complacent about it. We have allowed our nation to go to war five times, and almost, except for Gulf War One. None of them has resulted in what we thought it would be, and it ended up being very unpopular, and uh, we end up 
we end up really in a very bad situation. Are you all military veterans? Are you all military veterans? How, how often does any military plan turn out the way? No, con no plan survives contact with the enemy. That's the second thing we teach you after Task Force Smith. So <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that had one called the first five minutes of battle, so that's exciting. <laughs> Are there other questions? Thank you so much Thank for coming. You. Thank you.